All right, guys, so we're going to get started with the second half of chapter nine. So this is 9.2 lecture, um, and we're going to continue with our telephone techniques, but more specifically today, we're going to get into specialty calls, telephone services, and the legal and ethical issues related to telephone techniques. So with this section, or this section of the lecture, uh, we're going to discuss various types of common incoming calls and how to deal with each of them. We'll discuss various types of special incoming calls and how to deal with each. And then we'll discuss the, how the medical assistant should handle various types of difficult calls. Um, and then discuss typical outgoing calls including why knowledge of time zones and long distance calling is important. And we'll discuss the use of telephone directory and, how it descri uh, and, and describe how answering services and automatic call routing systems are used in a healthcare facility. And we'll discuss the legal and ethical issues related to telephone techniques. So let's start with the common ones. <clears throat> Um, now you're going to have many different types of people calling into your office daily um, and for many different reasons. This is really what we're going to get into this portion of the lectures, okay? Um, so we'll have people calling in for requests for directions. So it's important to have an accessible, clear set of directions on how to get to the office without uh, written out to read to the caller if it's requested. You should also prepare directions from various points in the area, okay, coming from both north, east, south, west. Um, you should have directions from every direction. And then you should place the map on the office website for patients to print, that way they can follow those as well. And you should place these directions close to the telephone so that all employees can easily access them. So if anybody were to call in um, asking for directions, anybody is able to help them out. Don't simply suggest that the patient refer to an internet map. Give them specific directions on how to get to the clinic. You know, sometimes you can't even rely on the internet to give you the most accurate directions. So always have it. Um, written out so that you can read that to them as well. <clears throat> You'll have inquiries about bills. So if a patient calls with a billing question, obtain their ledger from the computer or your file. So most generally it's going to be from your computer. Um, and, and a ledger is just an account, it's like their transactions like all the way out. Um, if inquiry is routine, ask if you can help to answer the question. You know, if they commonly do that, um, you know, see if there's a way around that so that, that you can prevent that step from happening. You can arrange payment plans and note the call record uh, in the medical record. Uh, and then refer the, to the billing office if it's necessary and if your clinic has one. If you're working in a small independent clinic, it might just be you running the whole office. So you might be the billing, the coding, the, the scheduler, you might do it all. So if you have a billing office and it's a question that you cannot assist with, refer to them. So there's a proactive way to reduce these numbers of calls uh, requiring or in inquiring about their bills, and that's just properly advising patients about the charges at the time of services are rendered. That way they're well aware of, of what to expect. And also, you know, let them know ahead of time when they're calling in for their first appointment, let them know about the copayment that they need to pay or, or any other fees that their insurance carrier may um, make them pay, okay? You'll have inquir inquiries about fees. So if they're curious as to how much it's going to be to have a rhinoplasty or something along those lines, you know, give estimates of fees before the patient sees the physician. Okay? But give them an estimate of the total charge and what to expect. Follow this by stating that fees vary depending on the patient's conditions and the tests that are specifically ordered for them. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to have a fee schedule available. So a fee schedule is just a list of all the things that your clinic does and the prices of those fees. So if fees are regularly discussed on the telephone, write down a suggested script in the policy manual. That way, you're repeating it the same way for every single patient. You can have calls about asking and, and inquiring if that doctor is a participating provider. Now, a participating provider is somebody that uh, participates, it's a person or a provider, a health insurance provider, that participates in their specific insurance plan. Now, this will help reduce costs for their total fees that they will come out with. So patients may call to inquire whether a physician is a participating provider with their insurance plan or their managed care organization. So insurance benefits vary from participating and non-participating providers, and a claim will be denied or reimbursement lessened if the physician is not a provider with the patient's insurance company. So that's why they want to figure out if you are a preferred provider or a participating provider. And it's important to keep a list of updated and valid plans by your phone. That way if anybody has a question, if you're, you know, if your physician is a participating provider in this type of health insurance, you can just quickly refer to that, um, that quick reference sheet by your telephone. 
you can have you'll have requests for assistance with insurances so insurance is a difficult subject to understand even for trained individuals familiar with various forms and procedures so it's important to, to be able to assist them as much as you can so medical facilities typically file all insurance claims that's how medical offices make their money is through the insurance claims so patients may call and inquire about a claim status you know has it been sent out has their money been received things like along those lines so you should answer inquiries patiently and provide all the help that you can and assist the patient any way possible. You can have radiology and, and laboratory reports. Okay, so original reports are usually delivered by the mail and added into the patient medical record. However, you might have some urgent reports that can be faxed, telephoned, or emailed to the physician's office so that it, it's like an expedited uh, feature. And then some facilities receive laboratory result, results directly from the laboratory by computer. Now, if you have like an EHR, an electronic health record system, where you're sharing it through multiple facilities, um, that might be an option for you. So it's important to relay all reports to the physician that come in from the lab. And if it's marked STAT, STAT is the acronym for immediately. And pay attention to that because you will need to know that for your CMAA exam. STAT means immediately, and that means the physician wants those results as immediately when they come in. Satisfactory progress reports. So the physician, may ask the patient to report on the condition a few days after the visit. That's common practice. You know, hey, just call the office uh, a couple days after the appointment and then check in and tell us how you're feeling. So take all calls and relay information to the physician if the report is satisfactory. You know, hey, you know, John Smith called in today. He said everything was all good. He's taking his meds as prescribed and he's feeling fantastic. So immediately inform the physician if a report is unsatisfactory. If the patient's still in a lot of pain, they're not recovering the way that, that you uh, expected them to, that needs to be reported to the physician immediately. So the doctor should provide instructions for the patient to follow in case the, uh, of an unsatisfactory report, such as calling into the office um, at such and such a time, or um, refer to the emergency room if it worsens. Those are some examples of that right there. So then you can have routine reports from hospitals and other sources. So hospitals and other sources may call to report about a patient's progress. It's important to take the message carefully and then give that message to the physician so that he can look over the notes and see if he wants to take any further actions. Um, so after you give that note or that message to the physician, it's important that um, you file it into the patient's medical record. That way all documentation is in there and you are keeping up with what you need to do. You can have calls about requests for referrals. <clears throat> now these may be handled without consulting the physician if a list of referral practitioners is provided. So if it's another doctor that you commonly work with, um, that you might have a list and he might be on it, that way you can just hurry up and get them in instead of having to clear it with a physician. So it's important that you handle all these calls as quickly as possible when they're coming in so that the patient may make an appointment to see uh, the referral physician as soon as possible. If an insurance plan requires a written referral, the physician must handle that. Okay, so most physicians require office visits to discuss that referral. So they want to get it, they want to see the patient before they actually go in for that surgery. They want, most physicians prefer that to happen. Then they can call the referral physician and, no, and notify them of that referral. So it's important to document all referrals in the medical record uh, as well. Then you'll have office administration matters. And these will more specifically deal with you guys here. So all calls may not refer to patients. You can have an accountant, an auditor, office supplies, or office maintenance, pe maintenance people call you all the time. So it's important that you handle these calls and refer, refer them to the appropriate person. For some of these calls, you may need to gather additional information and then return the call back to them uh, so that you are handling it the correct way. You might have patients that want to call in to discuss and they refuse to discuss symptoms with you, they want to discuss it with a provider. So the physician can't be expected to take numerous calls from patients who do not want to speak to the medical assistant. So some patients may just insist on discussing the symptoms with the physician only over the phone. So if the patient refuses to discuss the symptoms, suggest so he or she make an appointment to discuss them in person with the physician instead. Um, that way you are keeping that phone line open and you are uh, keeping that, that patient flow throughout the office running smoothly and not holding up the physician with these calls. You can have unsatisfactory progress reports, just like you can have satisfactory ones. So if you have people that are calling in after they've been seen by the provider and then a couple days later they call in and they aren't progressing the way they should be, 
it's important that you never give medical advice to patients because you are not qualified to do so. You're qualified for all the medical administrative tasks such as billing, coding, scheduling, um, talking and scheduling him to see the patient or to the, see to see the provider, but you are not certified or credentialed to give medical advice. So you never want to do that. It's important to make detailed notes about the patient's unsatisfactory progress. Okay, why is he unsatisfied? What is going on? Is he still in pain? Uh, does he have trouble sleeping? Things along those lines. And then it's important to present those notes that you've taken from that phone call and present it with a physician. And then after you've discussed that with the physician and there's been a plan of action in place, follow up with the patient on the physician's instructions. Now, it might be that he wants to reschedule and follow up immediately. It might be something like a medication change that may um, that they may want to make as well. So those are just some examples that you might have to be relating back to the patient. You can have requests for test results. So patients will call to see if their test results have come in. However, the physician must see the results and give permission to share the results with the patient before so. So patients do not always understand that the medical assistant does not have the privilege of giving out information without the permission of the physician. So they might um, become a little agitated that you're not giving their, them their test results right then and there. So only provide abnormal tests if authorized and give further instructions. Okay? If the patient's results is unfavorable, the physician should be the one to inform that patient and give further instructions. It should not be on your plate um, because you are not medically qualified to do so or have that conversation with the patient. And if there's any questions about that unsatisfactory report or unsatisfactory test result, you know, refer those questions to the physician. Let him answer those. <coughs> um, you might have to schedule an appointment with a physician for serious abnormal test results. So these types of test results are best re uh, relayed in person. You know, you never want to tell somebody that they may have cancer over the telephone. You know, that's just unprofessional, it's inappropriate, and it shouldn't be happening that way. Um, so it's important that you identify the patient properly before giving out results, because that could lead to a HIPAA violation if staff members um, don't correctly identify that patient. So you always wanna make sure you know who you're speaking with and identify that patient before you give out test results. And then the patient must give written permission before any information can be shared or given to third-party callers. Now, third-party callers could include like insurance companies, attorneys, relatives, neighbors, employers, um, or anybody else other than that patient. So it's important that you get that written permission to distribute their information from that patient before you do any of that. Hold on, I skipped one here. You can have calls about complaints about care or their fees. So there are four magic words that will often help calm an angry patient. So if somebody's calling and they're complaining about something and they're heated and upset and angry, you know, that just say, let me help you. Okay, let me help you. Let me see what I can do for you. Let me take care of this. So it's important to explain the charges by reviewing the bill with the patient. And you should do this beforehand with, with your estimations and, and going over your financial procedures in that office. So if the patient is angry, offer to pull the chart, research the problem and discuss it with the physician. All right, and reassure the patient that you are there to help. All right, let me help you. Those are the four key words, guys. If you are unable to appease the patient easily, the physician or office manager may prefer to talk to the patient directly. So if, if you're still unable to help them and, and you're kind of not getting any progress in, in calming that patient, you know, maybe let the, the physician or even the office manager handle that. You can have calls from staff members, families, and friends. So personal calls to the physician. Now there's two different types. There's personal calls to the physician, and then there's personal calls to the staff. So if there's a personal call that comes in for the physician, handle it according to the physician's instructions and be tactful. Most generally, if it's family, the physician is going to want to answer that question. However, if it's personal call from the staff, only take personal calls in the case of an emergency. Okay? Emergency calls could be coming through, so up from like patients trying to recall in with emergency situations, and the lines must be clear. So if you're having personal calls and it's not an emergency, you know, you're holding up a telephone line and you could be interfering with somebody's life. So that is really not the proper way to handle things. So we're all going to see this, guys. We're all going to see angry callers, um, especially in the medical office. So if you do encounter an angry caller or when you do encounter an angry caller, take the required action, okay? Never try to pass the buck or by saying, 
this isn't my job or I'm not the uh, person who filled out that insurance claim or something along those lines. You are a part of that team, that healthcare team, and you need to help you know, handle that and take those required actions. No matter whose fault the problem is, it is best to deal with it and find a solution instead of placing blame onto somebody else. So fix that person's problem, don't blame it on somebody else. Okay? Acknowledge the importance of the call and reassure the caller of your assistance. Again, let me help you. Okay, lower your tone of voice and volume to encourage a calm manner. That will always help. It's really hard to be angry and yelling at somebody who is calm, cool, and collected. Avoid getting angry and try to get to the root of the problem. So what's really going on here? What is, what is the cause of your anger? And let's figure that out. Express interest and take careful notes and then follow through on those actions. All right, it's all about customer service, guys. And if you have an angry and upset caller, okay, you have an angry and upset customer who may or may not come back to visit you. You can have aggressive callers. So it's important to reassure the caller that the concern is being, share, being shared is valid and it will receive the full attention from the right person, okay? So insist that whatever action they feel necessary, um, receive, insist that they receive whatever action they feel necessary immediately and treat them with a calm, poised attitude just like you would with an angry caller. Don't let aggression force you to take an inappropriate action such as getting heated and, and yelling back at the patient or something along those lines. Explain when the caller can expect a response from the office. Sometimes when these calls come in, they can't be handled immediately, okay? They need to be handled, they're gonna need to take some time, you might need to do some research. So if that's the case, explain to the caller when you can expect a response and then follow up on that appropriate action uh, and make sure that it was taken correctly, okay? You can have unauthorized inquiry or sales calls. Okay, so callers requesting information to which they are not entitled to should be politely denied. All right, you should never share patient information, guys, without having that authorization first from the patient. If it's a sale call, okay, they're trying to sell office supplies or medical supplies or equipment, okay, keep, try to keep those calls quick. And it's important to know which companies and representatives your office works with. So if you develop that good report and you, you know and you can establish which companies and reps you work with, um, so if you, and whose products are frequently used in the practice, it may result in discounted prices and the first news of sales and prom promotions. So that's why you want to build that good rapport with um, the different sales reps or different companies, especially if you're like a, an orthopedic clinic and you need to get braces and splints and things like that. You know, having that connection and that rapport with the person that sells that is always a benefit to you guys. You might have callers with difficulty communicating all right so if if callers are not primary English speakers they may be very difficult to understand so it's important that you use active listening skills as we talked about earlier and ask questions to be sure that you understand exactly what they need if a certain language is predominant in the area and you don't speak it the physician should consider hiring a medical assistant who is bilingual so if you are bilingual say you speak Spanish and English all right that makes you so much more employable. So that's something that you need to make sure that you write down on your resume. Uh, and then your typical outgoing calls, okay? Most of your outgoing calls are responses to calls that came into the office. You're returning, are you following up with a patient who had a complaint or a concern? Um, or you're calling out to remind them about an appointment that's going on. Um, so plan outgoing calls in advance. Have goals set up. What do I need to accomplish with this call? Do I need to let them know about an appointment? Um, do I need to you know, follow up and make sure they're taking their meds? No, and go into this call prepared. So organizing calls increases efficiency. Maybe you do all of your um, outgoing appointment reminder calls in the morning and then follow up in the afternoons with um, you know, just your follow up calls. So maybe that's an efficient way to run it and it's all gonna be based upon how you feel and how it's run in your office. Remember to treat those on the other end of the phone as if you wish to be treated, all right? Always think about that. Think about a time when you called the doctor's office and they weren't very helpful. That's what you don't want to be. You want to reach out to them and be as helpful as possible. One, because it makes you so much more employable. It'll help keep you get keep your job there and possibly move up into the ranks and it'll keep those customers coming back to you. So when you're making phone calls, guys, it's important to consider time zones. Now for us, we're all on the Eastern, Eastern Coast. It is the Eastern time zone. However, if you get close to the Midwest or you're making calls to California through a sales rep, it might be a little different. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you're trying to get information from an insurance company, 
the call sometimes to be uh, the call when someone will be available to answer your questions. So it's important to know where you're calling. Are you my calling to California? Am I calling to uh, Texas? So, uh, something along those lines. So there's basically four. There there are four time zones in the United States. Okay, we'll start with us. We're on the eastern side. Okay, from the eastern you get to central, and then you get to mountain, and then you get to Pacific. And if you look here, this is on page 141 in your textbook. You can see those different time zones. So United States, here we are up in northern Maine, okay, just on the brink of the Atlantic time zone, okay. But we are Eastern time. So if it's four o'clock Eastern time, it will be three o'clock Central time. If it's four o'clock Eastern time, it's going to be two o'clock Central time. And if it's four o'clock Eastern time, it will be one o'clock uh, Pacific time. So it's important to keep those in mind. So if you have, if you're an insurance carrier, you're working on the Eastern time zone and your insurance carrier that you need to call is in the Pacific time zone, you may wait, have to wait until 11 o'clock for that office to open uh, just because of the difference in the time zone. Long distance calling. Okay, Long distance calling can be an efficient way to get information quickly rather than sending a letter or something along those lines. So directory assistance can provide different numbers if you are unsure of who you're calling. So in some areas you can use 411. You know, 411 and then you say the, the type of business or, or the city and state you're trying to get to and then the, the name of the business or the person you're trying to reach. So that is a, a good tool. Sometimes internet, well internet searches are always free. Uh, it's always a free way to obtain numbers. So if you're trying to call another clinic or a healthcare insur uh, health insurance carrier and you're unsure of the number, just go do a Google search. You might find it there. Sometimes there's a fee that is charged for using directory assistance such as 411. So look up the phone number using free sources whenever possible. Um, such as the internet. If you reach a wrong long distance number, be sure to obtain the name in the city, name of the city and state that was called and report the information promptly to the local operator so that the facility will not be charged for the call. So if you call 411 and you say you want to get to Pasadena, California and you end up in El Paso, Texas, all right, let the, let the 411 director know that, hey, this is wrong. I never got to where I needed to go. That way your office is not charged. You can have inter internet service like Skype that will allow a user to call long distance through a computer with no long distance charges. So that could be a cool way to uh, you know, connect with somebody that you need to talk with. So using a telephone directory. It's important that you take a few, minute, a few moments to become familiar with your local directory. When you get your job, you settle down in its place, become familiar with your local directory, and then use it frequently for getting information quickly. Directions are found on the internet and in print format, so it's, it's important that you use that. So the primary purpose of a telephone directory is to provide a list for those who have telephones, their telephone numbers, and in most cases, their addresses. So it aids in the checking of spelling of names and locating certain businesses. So in a print telephone directory, color coding is often used to differentiate between residential listings and business listings. So those are the white pages and yellow pages. That is the difference. Okay. Most generally, the white pages is going to be, um, you know, your alphabetic pages. It's it's your uh, the names of your patients or last names of people. Okay. Yellow pages is more so related to the commercial and, and business listings. We're almost done here, guys. Answering services. So patients expect to be able to contact their provider if an emergency arises. So after office hours, most healthcare facilities will use an answering machine or an answering service. That way they're never missing a call that comes into the office. So with an answering first service, an actual person answers the call and, will, and, and then can be comforting that patient. So by the following criteria, by following the criteria given to them by the healthcare facility, patients can determine whether the provider or an on-call person should be contacted or if the patient should be directed to the emergency or the hospital's emergency department or whether the message can be taken and then relayed to the healthcare facility in the morning. So that's why answering services are used. <coughs> and then you have automatic call routing. Okay, this is a cool task, guys. This is, this is a good thing that can happen. This allows the caller to be given a choice of a, a menu of choices. Okay, do they want to speak to billing? Do they want to speak to insurance claims? Do they want to speak to the scheduler? Or something along those lines. So it can be an efficient way to handle a large volume of calls because it is screening your calls for you. Now, call routing systems can also make outgoing calls for you, and it can even connect into your um, electronic medical software and send out appoint appointment reminder calls, or it can send out new information about your clinic or something along those lines. 
So frustration can be minimized with automatic call routing by providing an option that connects the caller to the person uh, to a to a person option. For example, dial zero for an operator. We've all done that before. We've tried to call, you know, and, and we get stuck online and with this, you know, this computer talking to us. And most generally, I just push zero to get right to somebody I want to talk to, and then they can handle me from there. So let's in closing, we're going to talk about patient education. So recordings that offer health information can play while the patients are on hold. So if they ever call into the office or you're trying to look up something, put them on hold and be able to educate them about new offerings in the clinic or a, a new doctor that is in your practice or something along those lines. Um, use that time to your advantage. Messages about special events can be announced over that on hold or maybe even in your office or on the radio or something along those lines. And phone directories can offer listings of health information. So such features can address the needs of today's, uh, today's more information-oriented healthcare co consumers who are interested in healthy lifestyles and gaining useful inf information immediately. So your legal and ethical issues regarding telephone techniques, okay? So take care that no one overhears sensitive information while you're on the phone. As we talked about last lecture, still in chapter nine, you know, it's really important that you try to stay away from the speakerphone uh, function and feature in the medical office because it can be overheard. And do not place or receive personal calls while working. All right, the telephone is a business line and it should be reserved for patients and others conducting business within the office, not for you to call your boyfriend um, and see how his day is going. Um, the telephone and message records may be brought into court as evidence. So it's important to keep documentation and everything uh, up to date as well. And then make sure all messages that you write down are complete and legible. And guys, that brings us to the end of telephone techniques. Okay, it was a long chapter, there's a lot to learn there, but it was good stuff. So we talked about dealing with different types of patients today, um, and then the different services and options uh, your clinic can offer as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Keep up the good work, keep working hard, guys. I like it.